Well, hey guys, I'm Lynn Hansen. I'm one of the pastors here at North Park Church, and I'm really glad to be sharing with you in our life groups again this week. Well, this is uh, the Restoration series, as you can see behind me. And restoration has a reason. That's the fifth thing that we're talking about, the fifth requirement, the reason for restoration. A purpose, because you have a purpose, restoration has a purpose, and God has a purpose in your restoration. Are you getting a hold of that? The key verse, Psalm 51, and as you look at verse 13, notice he says, Then I will teach you, uh, teach your ways to sinners, and they will return to you. Forgive me for shedding blood, O God, who saves. Then I will joyfully sing of your forgiveness. Unseal my lips, O Lord, that I may praise you. Are you getting a hold of this? Then, then, then. You were made to do something with your life. You were not created to take up space. You're not created to waste air. You're not created to be served. You're created to serve. And that's what God has for you. And the reason for your restoration is so that you can do that. And you can begin to serve God and people and find your purpose in this life and fulfillment and everything that God has for you. Restoration is God preparing you for His purpose. And so, what might be worth thinking about, uh, if you'll just forgive me, is this. If God is the source of real restoration, it all comes from Him, and, and His purpose in restoration is so that you can do something with your life, well then, He doesn't owe you restoration or anything whatsoever if you're not interested in doing His purpose with your life. That is, if the reason you want restoration... Now think about this. If the reason that you want restoration is in some way different than the reason that He wants to give it, well then why should He give it to you? James chapter 4, verses 2 and 3. Uh, he says here, you want something, and, but you don't get it. Sound familiar? Could be restoration we're talking about. Could be getting past some major hurdles in your life, you know. And he says, you kill and you covet, but you cannot have what you want. You say, well, I don't kill and I don't covet. Are you sure you don't try to climb over the backs of other people to get what you want, to get you know, what you think is going to uh, help you and... and, and make you more of what it is that you want. He says you even quarrel and you fight. You do not have, now listen carefully, you do not have because you do not ask God. But when you ask, you do not receive. See, even when you do ask, you do not receive because you ask with the wrong motives. You have the wrong reason in asking. What is the wrong reason? He says right there, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. Okay, uh, how about you? Do you want to be restored so that you can do something good? God's plan with your life. Is that why you want to be restored? See, I, I want you to understand that selfishness is your biggest and greatest emotional enemy. It's huge. Some of us are making nothing but emotional choices and decisions. You know, there's nothing positive that comes out of it. There's nothing gratifying or building or strengthening about it. And you look at the choices that you make when they're emotional choices, and you will end up dried out because of them. Finagling and manipulating to make it happen? Well, what about your motive? What is, what's the reason that you want uh, to be restored? What's, what's the purpose in it that you have in your heart? Remember, the sin nature is a selfish nature. It, it's, it's a selfish nature by nature. <laughs> and we are selfish by nature. We were born uh, with a selfish nature. Wanting what you want for yourself. For your own emotional relief. But God says the way to get restoration and all of your needs met is precisely the opposite of selfishness. And you know that. I know that, don't we? Because... Selfishness never really gets you what you want. 
In fact, Psalm chapter 37 and verse 4, now watch this on your outline. Delight yourself in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. See, instead of manipulating and conniving, God's way is trusting and loving Him. Um, delighting yourself in Him so that He can give you the desires of your heart, so that the desires of your heart are right. Therefore, often the reason that uh, you know we think we have to make things happen for ourselves, it's because of a damaged past. It's because that's the way we've gotten things done all our lives. It's because that's what we've been taught, and it's because that's the mode that we're in. It's selfish mode. It's damaged past that causes you to do things selfishly and do it your way. It's what we've always done. Nice guys finish last. You ever heard that? Looking out for number one. You ever heard that? Um, fool me once. You ever heard that? See, it's all about me. 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 Protecting me. 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 It's all about my fears. My fears. My fears. I should do that with an echo. My fears. My fears. My fears. My fears. How has God used your past to prepare you to do the things that He has planned for you. See, instead of using your past as a springboard to keep trying to get things to go your way, how has He used your past to set you up, to design you, to build you, to make you, to mold you, to do His plan? See, what you think may have reduced your usability has actually or or at least potentially can increase your usability. You might say that the things that you have done and experienced that damaged you um, have actually made you more completely equipped to do God's work. Isn't that awesome? It's true. Check out a few people in the Bible. The Apostle Paul who was a destroyer of Christians, chased him down and wanted to kill every believer in Jesus Christ. Jesus got a hold of him, made him the most powerful person in the Bible for reaching people for Christ. How about Peter? He's so famous for his denial of Jesus. He screwed up so bad, but then Jesus reinstated him. And that denial just shot him forward like a catapult in uh, growing up to do the things that he was designed to do, to shepherd God's people and grow God's people. The damage that you have encountered in your life can actually make you more completely equipped to do God's work. That's what his plan is in it. If you'll get off your plan, that's what his plan is. If you'll now trust him instead of you, trust him to restore you uh, and use you as he sees fit. Use your life as he sees fit. Look at that key verse again. Psalm 51, verse 13. Then, after all of this stuff has happened, and the restoration that I've allowed God to do, then I will teach your ways to sinners, and they will return to you. Forgive me for shedding blood, O God, who saves. Then I will joyfully tell others about your forgiveness. Unseal my lips, O Lord, that I may praise you. Who is, think about it now, who is the most effective for God? Who does the most good? Is it the person who is restored and teaches sinners? Um, or the person who has never really had much of a problem and goes about teaching sinners? You know, the thing is this. There are lots of people out there preaching what everyone is doing wrong. You know, getting on their soapbox and, and talking about this is wrong and that is wrong and this is wrong and that is wrong. And people know more about what they don't believe than what they do believe. But the person who knows the source and the value of their own restoration is incredibly effective for God and for good. That's the person who teaches sinners and then they return 
to him. You know? That's the effective witness for Jesus Christ. Alright guys, God has a plan for you. He's got a plan for you. He's got a plan for you. He's got things that He's designed for you specifically to do based on your experience and your past and, and, and the restoration that He's given you up to this point. So let's talk about some discussion questions, okay? Question number one. Are your past sins, now this is going to take some thought, are your past sins and mistakes really mistakes? Were they really mistakes? In other words, was it God's providence or your free will in those mistakes? Talk about that. Don't argue. Talk about your point of view on that. What do you think? Are your past sins and mistakes really mistakes? Go ahead. Question number two. What stands in the way of you doing the good things that God has planned for you to do? Did you catch it? What stands in the way of you doing the good things that God has planned for you to do? What's your greatest fear? What, what's your greatest challenge? What is the cause of your procrastination? What stands in the way of you doing the good things that God has planned for you to do? What stands in the way of you getting on God's plan completely, totally? Go ahead and talk about that, would you please? All right, one last thought. Um, doing good. You know, there's a lot of do-gooders out there. And doing the good things that God has planned is great. It's a great thing. But, get this now, get this. Teaching while you do it, that's the goal. That, that's where you need to arrive at. The Bible says that the chief goal that God has for you is to become Christ-like. To grow in the likeness of Christ. Every day, everything that you do, grow in the likeness of Christ. So teaching while you do those good things, that's really the goal. The way that you uh, and North Park grow best and and North Park becomes most effective in reaching people is when you get a hold of the fact that you're not just supposed to do a job for God. Okay? You're not just supposed to do a job for God. What are you supposed to do? Well, you're supposed to grow and disciple others as you do the things that God has planned for you. In other words, as you sit down to the computer with, with someone or show someone where the vacuum sweeper is or, or you, you do this job or that job or talk to this person or that person your primary purpose is to teach them to be Christ-like to develop a Christ-like character in them think about it that's how the church really grows is you out there doing that. And that's why he says in the key verse, teach me and I will teach. Forgive me and I'll sing about forgiveness. Notice what his prayer is. Look at the key verse again. Uh, this is uh, Psalm 51 and verse 15. His prayer is, unseal my lips, O God. Make me outspoken about you. Let me teach others because you've taught me. Question number three. Are you ready to move forward with that? <laughs> ready to adopt that prayer as your own? Ready to quit being complacent and to start helping people grow in whatever you do? Are you ready to do that? Are you ready to make a commitment to that? Quit talking about your fears. Quit talking about what stands in the way. Are you ready to move forward with that? Do you believe God or do you believe your stuff? Are you ready?